Let's give Jesus a big hand of praise together. Let's praise the Lord. Come on. Make a loud noise to God. Let's appreciate our band members once again. Let's thank the Lord for them. Praise and worship leaders, powerful, really anointed time. Great time of prayer, wonderful time. Please be seated, everybody. I'm just thinking, do I have any special announcement to make or nothing? Otherwise, everything's good. Wonderful. Because we've been asked this question a few times uh, over this last few weeks, um, some of the leaders said, I think, I think we should address this issue that many people are concerned about. And because, you know, because there's been so many things going on on your chats, on the blogs, on Facebook, on Twitter, and... Um, on all these things that people are very concerned about what has been said with regards to the economy of the country, the stability of our country, finance, money. People are paranoid. They are frantic. Some people have been talking about how many of you have heard. Don't be shy to put up your hand if you've heard of this thing called the blood moon recently that they've been talking about. Yeah, quite a few of you. And, uh, you know, and there's all these things that are going about, um, and let me just, uh, hopefully in this next few sessions that I hope to do a series with, hello, was that God calling, no, all right, silent your phone, oh, forgot to do mine, I, uh, I hope to be able to teach you the word of God and to be able to instruct you with the word of God so that you are Bible based and not panic-based and fear, and that has come into so many people's heart. In fact, Jesus said, and I know he's coming back again, he said, when I come, he said, men's hearts will be failing them. You know, the rate of heart failure has gone up in scale. Even young people are dropping dead, you know. I mean, people are just, their hearts are filled. So he said, will I find faith when I come? Would people still be gung-ho about the things of God? Will they be front-footed rather than back-footed? Oh, the devil's attacking. Who's the Antichrist and all? I want to just say this about the blood moon. I want you to know, first of all, as a child of God, after Jesus came into this world and died for us, you don't have to worry about any moon unless you're a lunatic. Okay? The Bible is very clear. Now, some people, it's just that they don't read the Bibles. They read their, 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 their WhatsApp more than they read the Bible. And, so, and then they come to church paranoid, and they come to church nervous and sit there, and all these things are in their head, and they cannot get what God is saying to them. Just a hundred times they hear it goes over there. So this message is for the sake of those who are new to our church, and I hope you old, older ones will get, you know, revived and get assured in your heart that God hasn't fallen off his throne. He's still in control. Unless you are a Jew and you are into the moon thing, go for it. I ain't a Jew. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the living God. And my God is not the moon. He's the sun. And he is reigning. And he's on high. Now, there will be times of distress and difficulty. It's not a new thing. From the beginning of time, man has faced hardship. In the Old Testament, they called it famine, drought, plagues, earthquakes, about the same, yeah? Wars and rumors of more wars. And Jesus said these things will be there. It's, these are signs at the end of coming. But he says not yet the signs. He said, but when the gospel of my kingdom, when the gospel of my kingdom is preached to all people, then will the end come. The, the thing we should be looking forward is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and not any other thing. 
And so I want to talk about some things for those of you who are new on how to handle this whole world situation. I'm being very naughty by using the American dollar and I'm entitling my message, In God We Trust. And I put a question there, <laughs> really. Isn't it amazing that the Americans would put it on the, they could have chosen any word to put on the dollar. But they chose this four words. Why? Because man has a tendency to trust that dollar more than they would trust God. They, were, they have a tendency to trust gold and money and finances and property and, 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 uh, and, and things, tangible things, more than they could trust God. So the forefathers, the early fathers who founded the United States of America knew that that would be the trend, that people would kill for money, that they would serve money, that they would worship money. So on that dollar note, they put these words, in God we trust. And that was the stability of America those days. If you are seeing some things in your life that you don't like, you have the power to change it. You are not a victim. Don't sit there and suck your thumb and feel sorry for yourself or things are so bad. You have the power. God gave everybody the power to choose. Now listen carefully as I take you through this step by step. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. When people come to me and say, Pastor, please pray for me, I will. That is my calling and that is my duty and that is my passion. Because when we pray in Jesus' name, God works miracles. All right? So when people call me to go into the hospital, into an intensive care, I go in there like a man on fire. I'm loaded. I don't play games when I, I go in there. I'm filled with the word of God. I'm speaking the name of Jesus. I'll go for miracles. I'll go for God. And I pray for people. Some people come and say, pray for our marriage. And I'll pray for you. I'm committed to you. I pray for your marriage. I pray that God will help you, I'll help your children. But listen carefully. Praying is one thing. Obeying is something else. Okay? Because I can pray for your marriage, but if you treat your wife like a jerk, that's not going to help. Hello? So I want to be not just your pastor. I want to be your friend. And I hope you see me more as a friend who cares about your well-being. So I want to teach you stuff about, you know, and so we have seminars and, and, and we've got Bible studies on different subjects and how to improve your relationship, how to date well. And, you know, I mean, we go through all that. We're human. How to find the right life partner and all those things we talk about and like the men's thing that we're going to have, your different personalities, how to understand people at work. And, of course, we are all on a learning stage here and we are learning about how God made us the way we are and how to understand other people so we can work together. So we are, we, we are trying to help you with life so that you can do life well. And you will have very few regrets and you will say you will have a lot of good things that you can celebrate God for. I go in the back of my house sometimes and there's a big spider web. Day after day, there's this big spider web. And many of us have got spider webs in our lives. And all we do is clean the webs away. One day I went to the back and that big ugly spider was there. And I took two, two things and I smashed it. Guts and blood and all splattered all over. As it dropped down dead and I left it there as a lesson to other spiders. <laughs> hoping that some crow will come and get a nice juicy ooey gooey spider. I'll tell you what, the spider isn't there and therefore the webs are not there anymore. A lot of us, we're just cleaning up the spider web. And you need to kill the spider. So when it comes to your finances, many of us are just running around. You know, we are confused. We are trying to do this to patch that. We borrow from Peter to pay Paul. And we are confused about our finances. And you're saying, my God, what's happening? I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Now listen, this is not about going to heaven. Going to heaven is a given. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Going to heaven is a given. Amen. Going to heaven is a Jesus only thing. There's not a thing you can do about going to heaven. The Bible says, by grace we are saved through faith in Christ, not of ourselves. 
You can't save, your, save yourself. So Jesus came to die to save us. Are you with me? Yeah. So this is not about going to heaven. We're talking about heaven coming down on earth. We're talking about a bit of heaven in your marriage, a bit of heaven in your finances, a bit of heaven in your business. And bad times are, seem to be closing in on everyone, and you need to hear not the wisdom of man, not Pastor Joe's wisdom, <laughs> but you need to hear the wisdom from God. Amen. So when we look at the American dollar, and I'll use some examples today from the American economy and what they think and what they believe, but from the very start, in their purchases, they etched it there. This is not what we trust, but it is in God we trust. And I pray that each and every one of you will learn this precious lesson starting right now, that this is how I am going to orchestrate my finance. This is how I'm going to do business. This is how I'm going to face the world. In the midst of all that is going on, I know who I am trusting in. And it's not you, sir, it's not your business, it's not your words, not what you promised can be, it's not what you prophesied. I put my trust in God. In God, I trust. Luke chapter 16 verse 13 says, no one, no one can serve two masters. He says, no one can do that. Luke 6 verse 13. He says, you will either hate the one and love the other. Or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Where are the scriptures, Chin Fei? You cannot serve God and mammon. He didn't say you must not serve God. He said you cannot serve God. So God is very clear about that. You can't say, I will, you know, I'll be a Christian, but at the same time, if my finances are ruffled, I, 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 you know, I'll panic and I'll, I'll serve my money. He said, you can't do that. You either will serve God or you will serve the money. And Jesus was very clear. He said, where in Matthew 6 verse 21, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. All right, Matthew 6, 21. And your heart is the thing. Is it, you know, what your heart treasures, that's what you're going for. You know, I, my heart doesn't treasure skiing. Or riding fast bikes. So my treasure doesn't go there. Right? So I'm not interested in fast cars. I like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of you love that. You love to take a, open a bike and fix it. And your money goes there. That's, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. So my heart is golf. For example, if, if I'm going to do golf, you know, a set of golf balls, they're very, very expensive. But suddenly, my, my hand reaches to my wallet and I'm willing to depart with my treasure because that's where my heart is. Now, and, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that where your heart is, that's where you're going to reach to your wallet to make sure that you pay off your treasure for where your heart is. I want to talk about how God wants to prosper us because he hasn't changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I want to share some things with you that might be practical. And if you've got a marriage problem, you need to see a counselor. There's nothing to be ashamed about. As Abby was saying just now, we all have fallouts. We all have failures. If you've got family issues, your kids are not listening to what you're saying, or there's some kind of an issue, or there's a rebellion, there are people who can counsel you on how to raise the family, and it's good to sit down and talk to people like that. So when it comes to finances, and I know there are a lot of young people who are here, and this is one of the concerns that's on their heart. Pastor, I have to pay my studies. I have to rent a place. I have to go to college. I have to get married. I have to put aside, and things are so expensive these days in Malaysia. I can't afford to buy a house. I'm going to tell you God's word and I trust that you will put God's word in your heart because I can give you examples of many people who have learned these simple principles and if you learn it today and apply it consistently you will find that God not only will supply all your needs he will go before you and prepare a blessing for you it's very simple nothing difficult if we had a seminar here today and in one room, we had a room where they were teaching on the Antichrist, what was the signs of the Antichrist, and, and, and who is the Antichrist, and what happened, what's happening in Europe today, and how that affects us, and the Red Moon. You will find 
in one seminar, let's say we had that, and in another seminar, we would have teaching like how to treat your wife better, uh, how to date, how to hunt, <laughs> you know, how to save money, practical stuff, yeah? You will find the end time seminar packed with people. And the how to do life well, very, very few attended. Why? Because human nature has a tendency to always like to postpone or blame our lack of blessing on somebody else or the answer to our problem is one day soon someone will come and sort it all out for us. We don't want to say, I must take responsibility. I have to get up early to go to work because my boss isn't hiring me because of my hairstyle but because of the almighty dollar. Are you making a profit for the company? Some people don't understand that. And they say, well, I'm a Christian. And you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know why my boss, well, you're late. It's got nothing to do with your religion. Now, some Christians don't like to be told that, especially people overseas. You know, I felt really hurt. I went for an all-night prayer meeting, and then the next day I couldn't get up to go to work, and the boss sacked me. Serves you right. If I was your boss, I would have sacked you. Because I didn't hire you to go to an all-night prayer meeting. That was your choice because you love God and you went to, you sacrificed your sleep. But I, as your boss, would, you know, so Christians don't understand these things. Oh, but, but I expected every, no, no, nobody's going to feel sorry for you. You've got to take responsibility for your finances as well. So if there are seminars about marriage, then how much more are there seminars for finances, and learning to do good. So because you came to church, and this is our authority, young people, listen carefully. I'm going to teach you out of the word of God. Are you with me? All right? And you must be willing to receive it. Okay. So let me just talk about this one thing today. It is called the tithe. The tithe. T-I-T-H-E. What? Number one. So I'm just going to answer, ask questions and answer them. Number one, question one, what is the tithe? The Hebrew word for the word tithe means the tenth part, 10% 10 of your earning. That is the tithe. So I'm teaching you that. So you, in case you read it in the Bible and you're wondering what's a tithe or how to pronounce it, everybody say tithe, tithe. right? Not titi, tithe, all right? So uh, it's the one-tenth of your income. Of your earning. Now, I'm, just, I'm just saying because there are new people here and I don't want you to go around asking people, what's the TT? I've heard that. No, that's, it's the tithe. All right? Okay. Number, question number two. What does the Bible have to say about the tithe? What does the Bible have to say about the tithe? The Bible has a lot to say about the tithe. A lot. All right? The Bible puts the tithe in, an, in, in a category that's not optional. In other words, when it comes to the tithe, it's not for you to choose. All right? Some of you are getting, you know, a bit nervous. It is not your choice. It's got nothing to do with what you think a tithe is. In Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, it tells us, And all the tithe of the land, all, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. The tithe is not yours. It is God. Now, because in Israel, they were an agricultural society, so they, did, they didn't have dollars and cents like we do. Yeah, they had gold and silver, but they did their business with crops and cattle and livestock. So because of that kind of a background, this is how they talk. Uh, about their tithe. In 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 5 and 6, the Bible tells us, as soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits. Everybody say first fruit. Okay. The first fruits of the grain and the wine, oil and honey, and all the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. Everybody say everything. everything. Everybody say tithe. tithe. Oh, you're still okay. Very good. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the cities of Judah, brought the tithe of the oxen and the sheep 
and all the tithe of holy things which were consecrated to the Lord God, they laid in heaps. They brought their tithe in abundance. They brought it. Everybody say they brought. Right. So because it was an agricultural society, they couldn't send their tithe. They brought it. All right. So they brought the best calf. The, 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 the cow gave birth. It was the first calf. And normally the first one looks the best, probably had tint on it and everything. And it's the nicest. And you are so wanting to keep it because the children looked at it and said, oh, daddy is so and we could keep it maybe the second and third one remember remember that when a cow gives birth there is no guarantee it's going to give birth again so they had to exercise more faith and trust they really had to say in God we trust man we hope this cow gets pregnant again Shoo, quickly go make love you know because this little one is going to die. It's going to be sacrificed, cut into nice pieces of steak. And what are they going to do with it? Burn it. I mean, this is my best. And what did they do with it? Burn it. It was all about trust. Everybody say trust. That's why the early fathers of the United States, it's no accident that they became so quickly the greatest nation in such a short time in the world. And so let's look at one more scripture. What, in Psalms 24, by the way, just to let you know, the earth is the Lord. He lets you have it, but it's still his. If you got into a Lamborghini today and your friend who lives in Bukit Damansara said, hey, bro, I want you to lend you, lend you my Lamborghini. Take it out, take your wife for a date night. And you, man, you get into that Lamborghini. Your wife looks at you and says, wow, say, my very good friend just told me, use it for date night. I take it, I'm out on a date with my wife. And when I finish driving her home, and I go back to the one who owns the Lamborghini, I don't go to him and think, say to him, look, I'm giving you a Lamborghini. No. <laughs> so what are you talking about? It was mine. I lent you. I'm, I'll say to him, I'm bringing back your Lamborghini. It was yours in the first place. God owns everything. The book of Haggai says the silver and the gold, the cattle on a thousand hill. Hello. He just lets you have it. And out of that, he said, I want you to be a good steward. But we act and the, you wait till the next few series when I talked about who is rich. And you'll be shocked when I show you statistically who is really rich on this planet. You don't want to miss that session. Who is rich? But let's go back to this very basic thing because there are some young people who are dying to give their tithe. But you just don't know what to do. So I've got a few questions that I will answer. Now this is what God is saying to you and I. He's teaching us not a law. He's teaching us the DNA of the kingdom of God. And what is the DNA of the kingdom of God? It's generosity. It's big. It's, you don't have to legislate this. It was made a law by Moses. But before Moses made the law, 470 years before Moses was even born, Abraham was a tither. Because it is not something that is God expects us to like, I have to give my tight my 10% you know that is ah he doesn't want that kind of a spirit he wants you to be like him a generous big hearted God so that he can continue to bless you amen so this is what God wants I remember when I first accepted Christ Stella and I were very young I was 23 she was 21 and we both decided right from that time, in fact, when we were dating, we already said, whatever we get, 10% goes to God. We learned that from a very young age. And in those days, I was paid with cash. So I brought my tithe with cash. And in those days, it was good enough for a young couple and, you know, and then just going to have a child. 
so I was getting, I think, about 300 Malaysian ringgit a month or something like between the two of us. But you know, from that time, 300 something or 400 ringgit, I think 40 ringgit will go into the envelope. And we gave it into the church that we were pastoring. Why? Because that church also ministered to us. The Bible says bring it to the storehouse because in that church people were praying for us. There were worship leaders who were leading in worship where we worship. Our children were raised up in Sunday school. Our children were raised up in the youth. So they were ministered. The Bible says bring it to the storehouse. So in those days, it was with cash. As time went by, we had to open a bank account. Church started paying us with a check. And so we started bringing the tithe in a check. We put aside our 10% from younger days. Today, I send my tithe, and I will make sure that my, our, our clerk knows about it. I'll send her an email. I will send it. It's not that I'm not bringing it because, you know, I'm not bringing a cow. In the same spirit, I would say, God, I'm thankful that I can send this money, and I'll do it online. And I'll just send it online, send an email to our uh, a church administrator, and she will acknowledge she's received our tithe. The first thing we do, as young people until today. So sometimes you look at other Christians who are doing well, who are serving God and are multiplying, and the world has gone bad and, you know, retrenchment and downsizing of companies. But these people seem to get the favor and the blessing of God. Why? Because from they made it a discipline in their heart. I'm not going to touch this tithe. It belongs to the Lord. So we bring it faithfully. And uh, while we do that, our 10% goes to the church. Above that, we give our offerings. Many people in our church are doing that. We give towards our mission funds. We are supporting churches. We are supporting an orphanage. Stella and I will make sure that we also uh, put it online, our giving or financially. And our offering, that's above and beyond our tithe. And we'll give towards people who have needs. And we'll just put into our offering every week. We don't look to the left. We don't look to the right. We say, in God we trust. And some months have been really tough, but we pull our wallet open. We determine every Sunday, I'm going to put this, you're going to do that. No questions asked. And he has multiplied our blessing. You know, people come over and they, 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 they look at our lifestyle and say, you, you know, you, what the? You're a pastor. How come you're living in this kind of a lifestyle? I say, I don't know. Ask my God. I don't know. But he just loads on us, like spoils us with blessing. Does that mean that we don't go through tough times? Oh, yes. In fact, Stella is preaching right now in the other church with a terrible, terrible voice loss. She's, she couldn't speak. In fact, for three days, she had no voice. It was very quiet. The house was wonderful. <laughs> I won't tell her I said that. But no, I'm just saying. And today, she's going, ah, and she's preaching. We, we go, look, we go through changes, and we go through tough times. And, but I tell you what, our God whom we trust, always comes through. Always comes through. So for some of us who struggle with these things, I want to encourage you. This is how we do it. This is how the Bible says we do it. We give our offering. And then on top of that, we had our building. And we just took out whatever we had at that time and put a portion of it aside and took the rest of it and just put it into our building. We're always looking for an opportunity. I want you to know something. Catch this if you can. The DNA and the culture of the kingdom of God is generosity. Big heartedness. And that's why you find Christianity throughout the world, even though they're persecuted, whatever you might see, you find that those who understand this biblical principle... Now, there are many Christians who hold back. They'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. How many people, Christians, who have tasted the goodness of God, taught the word of God, but they'll still sit there. I know people who've been in our church for 10 years, hear a message like this, still sit there and hold back. And then every time they'll come to the altar and ask for prayer for this and that and the other. And God wants us to have his heart and to be big hearted. Is that helping you? Question number three, what if I can't afford to tithe? That's a basic question. That means you're not being paid. That would mean that you don't have a work, a job. And I understand that. That's understandable. But let's put aside the tithe issue for a while. Let's put that aside for a while. Studies have shown, and going back to America, because we're using the almighty dollar, 
Studies have shown that most Americans or even Malaysians never give to a charitable cause, put aside tithes or anything. Why? Because this is what they like to say. I can't afford to give. I don't have enough money. Times are bad. How many of you have heard that? Of course, I want to give to charity, but I can't afford to because I don't have enough money. The can't afford to give category people, most of them are from, you'll be surprised, are from a higher income bracket. People who are of a lower income bracket are very generous. <laughs> this might shock you, but that's what they say in America. And if you know anything about America, there's a place called the Bible Belt, which is, uh, I think, uh, Texas, Alabama, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Mississippi, the Bible Belt, where there are most churches and Christian organizations. Initially, those places were very, very poor compared to New York or San Francisco or some other places. But these people, there was a revival, and mainly the Baptists and uh, charismatic movements moved along there. Very strong churches. And one of, the thing, one of the things in the Baptist church they teach from young until old is that you've got to learn to be a tither. You've got to learn to be big-hearted. You've got to learn to be generous. And so you find that Bible Belt statistically have given more than most cities in the USA. Why? Because many of the Christians from young have been taught that. So that category of I can't afford to give, this is what happens. If you approach your finances, and I want you to imagine a pie. Can we have the pie up, uh, Benson? If you approach your finances like you would approach a pie with all its slices that are there, and these are all your expenses and your finances, your thinking. So the first time you get your pay, you, you, you look at your pay and say, okay, I've got these expenses that I have to spend. Young people, I hope you're following. Let's say it takes up, to me, it takes up about 40% of my income when I had a house or when I bought a house, 40%. So this is 50%, just exaggerating a little bit. But let's just say this is how you approach your expenses. The first thing you say I've got to pay is your mortgage, your house. So we'll take that off. So that's, that's gone. And then your insurance, which is about 20% or, or give and take. Um, I would include maybe food, you know, nowadays because uh, you're so busy, you don't have time to cook, so eating out is a, an option. It's not that expensive in Malaysia, actually, compared to my son-in-law lives in Australia. They said, he would say to me, Papa, I said, eating out is very expensive, so good to cook in. But let's just say your insurance, let's hit the insurance thing. That goes out of your pie. And children, my God, are they expensive. Wait till they come. Oh, they'll need braces. They're going for the daycare. And then they want designer clothes. And then they're going to school. And then uh, they, they want all these things done. And they'll take up. You just wait, young people who haven't got children. I'm just saying, if this is how you approach your financial expenses, you'll say, this goes to the house. This is insurance. And then the kids, boom. Let's go, get the kids out of there. And then utilities, everything that you have to pay, and all the electricity, and we gotta have aircon because there's a haze outside, and we'll die of suffocation and lung cancer. And so that's your utilities, we gotta pay that, don't mess around. And then you've got a holiday. You know, you gotta put aside a little bit, otherwise the wife will divorce you. You've gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta take her out. And then you've, that goes, go! And then you've got the car. Man, you just bought a car, you got the house, you got all these expenses, and then the car, you have to pay for the car, and all of a sudden you realize there's nothing there. What can I give God? So people who approach their financial pie by saying, I will pay my bills first, will have no chance in this message that I'm talking about. So they'll sit there and look and say, how the heck am I going to give tithes and building funds and mission that I can't afford to give? Correct, because you just ate the whole pie. <laughs> and so we do have sometimes a little bit, and when conscience strikes us, we feel a little bit sad, and so we put in a little leftovers for God. 
And we give God some leftovers. Here's a few change. Here's that dollar. I wouldn't even want to give it to a coffee shop. It's stained. It's got oil on it. We'll give it to church. And then you wonder why all hell breaks loose when you should be having a little of heaven on a thy kingdom come. Thy will be done where? Right in your lap, in your house, in your job. Man, give me a little bit of that heaven, Lord. I want some Give me some heaven, Lord, but you do nothing when these principles are being taught to you. Everybody still happy here? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible says, but seek first. When it comes to God, it's always first. You bring your tithe on the first week of the month. These are the first fruit. God will not Accept or bless. Well, I did give. No, he ain't going to bless it because it was your leftover. As you heard Yenny share just now, she didn't know I was going to preach this. And she said, Cain, in the process of time, as he was feeling, ah, I think I should go to church and give God my leftovers. And God had no regard. God, listen, God isn't paid by you. Talk to the people here, more exciting. This one's a bit boring. They're looking at me. God isn't paid by you. You can't pay God. He owns everything. Are you listening? So get off your high horse. Get off your snotty nose in the air and think that you own the air. The very air that you're breathing is his. He lets you breathe it. You could be on a ventilator right now or something, or, you know, something that's keeping your body going until they decide you're such a pain and a nuisance. Let's switch it off. <laughs> As a pastor, I visit people like that all the time. None of them on their dying bed say, you know, I, uh, I wish I had bought that stock market sales. I tell you, I wish I had made more money. None of them, none of them say that. When they're dying, none of them say, I wish I had, I uh, should have bought that investment today. Uh, Talaka, that fellow went and bought it. Uh, I, nah. None of them. I'll tell you, I'm a pastor. I walked into the hospital. None of them have said, Pastor, I tell you, I have my biggest regret. Is I should have bought that apartment. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 4. The first fruits also of thy corn, of thy wine, and your oil, and the first of the fleece of your sheep thou shalt give. Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your substance, and with the first fruits of all, God will not take second best. The first, he says. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 14 in the NIV. Remember that it says, uh, what does it say? And, thou sh and you must not sell or exchange any of it. In other words, don't touch the tithe. This is the best of the land and must not pass into other hands because it is holy to the Lord. So in the same way, the children of Israel, when they had the first fruits of a tree, they would tie a reed around the tree and they would say this out of all the orchard, this tree is bearing first. All right, so this one belongs to the Lord. And while the others later on begin to blossom, they say, this one, we've already marked it. They make sure that it is fully ripe. They will take it all down. Not one fruit will come. They will bring it into the house of the Lord. The cattle will be the same. They brought it. It was their first, and they honored God. And it was a, like a party mode. As they were bringing, others were bringing their little calf or their little sheep. Or the, you know, the poorer ones, they didn't have maybe a ranch or anything like that. They will bring turtle doves, the best of their pigeons that they would have. 
that they were wearing, whatever they had. But who, whatever they had and whoever they were, when they brought it, there was a lot of singing and dancing. It was like a, like a fiesta, a party festival. People were blowing the trumpets. Others were playing on the lute and string instruments. And they came together. On the first day of the first week of the month, they would come together to the temple of the Lord. There would be such an occasion, such a celebration. I hope when you bring your tithe or send your tithe into the house of God, you do it with joy and with gladness. God, I thank you that you have given me and kept me still alive. I have a job. I have a business. I have a car. I have a house. I can go out coming in healthy and strong. Nobody carries me or pushes me on a wheelchair. I thank you, oh God, that I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. The people walk with, with such confidence. You have taken care of our enemies. You have stopped them at the gate. Hallelujah. We are nowhere in comparison with that disease and that sickness and that plague and all of that that's coming against us. But God, we now bring to you our very first fruit with joy and with gladness. And then God began to just lay it on them, bless them. Not that God is a vegetarian or a steak eater, okay? Or that our Malaysian ringgit makes a big difference in the house of God. There was great joy. They demonstrated that they would rather have 90% to spend with the blessing of God than have 100% without his blessing. So why do I make my first check to the church where I, where, when I get paid? Because this is where God has blessed me. And God says, if you give me the tenth, I will bless everything about you. Listen to me. My visa card people never said that to me. Hey, Mr. Ramaya, when you make your first payment immediately, we will bless all your household. Hallelujah. No. In fact, they are hoping we will make late payments so that they can make late payment charges with interest. My bank doesn't say to me when I pay, you know, Mr. Ramaya, that you paid your house on time. We bless all your children's life and all your family. We bless your body, your health. We bless you in the name of Standard Chartered Bank. <laughs> none of them said that to me. None of them. And none of them will say that to you, you dipstick. <laughs> but outwardly you say, in God I trust. But oh no, you make sure those slices, that pie... That pie is not just a pie in the sky. It's a real thing. You go chunkety chunk, chunk, chunk. And then you say, oh, I can't afford to tithe. But I want the blessing of God on my life. Zippity doo da, zippity a. Now, please don't try to manipulate giving. And I want you to know something. In our church, we deliberately teach people that this is not a manipulation. Don't say, well, I gave $100. I'm expecting. God never said that's witchcraft. That's manipulation. Don't play games with God. Don't say things God didn't say. Well, if I gave that person my proton, God's going to give me a, a Ferrari. You, you hear? Come on now. You go to America, you hear some of these televangelists. They'll say, if you will, oh, I feel it in my heart. If you will just send this particular amount of money right now, right here, the Lord. I just feel it in my heart. Stretch your hands towards the television screen. <laughs> right now, right here, if you will just make that check out, people are ready to take your order. We love you. You've never even seen you. <laughs> so we don't use manipulation. It's witchcraft. To say something God didn't say is a lie. You're a bold-faced liar. That's what you are. But if you say something God has said in his word, then God gets the credit. And God wants to bless you. Poverty is not a blessing. If I give an altar call, now come, anyone here who wants me to pray for them that they will be poor, <laughs> that you will sleep on the road, you know, that you will sleep on cardboards, come, come receive that blessing, come. I'll have a full altar call, yeah? But some, pe some people think that, oh, well, if I just had enough, God will be pleased. With no, no, God wants you to have more than enough. It was, how can you be a blessing? This guy writes on Facebook, oh, he saw that child that was drowned and dead. It's a horrible thing. What some of these refugees running away. And he said, I, I just want to know, 
what can I do? I'll tell you what we can do. We can go to nations and teach people the word of God rather than just helping the refugees. And that's a great thing if we can help the refugees. But it's mindsets because half these refugees are Christian. The other half of these refugees are Muslim. And they are praying to God. And this is not the portion that God has for you as a child of God to be a refugee. Is that, is that consistent in the Bible? Are Christians supposed to be trampled under the foot of man? Jesus said, this is very clear. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the one that brings some flavor that makes sense in this insensible world. You make sense because you smile when you should be grumpy. You, you praise God when you should be cursing God. You, you walk with a, with a skip on your foot when you should be dragging yourself. Even though all those bad things have happened, you're walking and you're saying, in God I trust. I put my trust in God. You make sense in this world, Christian. So he says, if, a, if the salt has lost its saltiness, if the salt has, is no longer salty, Jesus said it, I didn't say it, I'll give you the verse. He said, you are therefore good for nothing. Anyone been called good for nothing when you were a child? I was many times by my teacher. You're good for nothing, child. That's like a curse. He said, you are thenceforth good for nothing but to be thrown and trampled. When salt is no good, they throw it out on the street so it helps to keep the dust in the Middle East down. So hot and dusty, they put that there so it cuts the dust that comes in. He said, you're just going to be walked on. And that's why people who are not salty for God get walked on. God doesn't want you to be under somebody's foot. He wants you to be the head and not the tail. Can somebody say amen? Is this good? Amen. So you young people who are launching out now, believing God for you know, new things. Let me tell you something. God's got no problem blessing you. Good marriage, good health, good home. Be a blessing so that you can be a blessing to other people. Now, let, let's move on. Question number four. Do I tithe my net income or my gross income? A frequently asked question. Okay? Which do I tithe, Pastor? Good question. I just want to answer that with a question. Which one do you want God to bless? Your net or your gross? <laughs> Tithing was never intended by God to be legalistic. It has always been something that God wants from the heart. As I said just now, Abraham, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 20. This is way before the law, way before the law. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, uh, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, uh, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Let's go on. And in the process of that time, it came to pass. Hey. You're asking, for, you're really asking, you're begging, please, Pastor. It, it's from verses 18 to 20. That's only verse, is that it? Yeah? I think the next verse tells us, I think. The next verse tells us, and, and Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek. If, it, if you can find it, put it up there. It's good for them. Because Abraham is like 400 plus years before the coming of Moses. And then comes Jesus. All right, let's look at Matthew 23, verse 23. Matthew 23, verse 23. All right, that, there you go. Okay, just go back a bit. Go back a bit, uh, Tim Fay, that verse that you showed just now. Let's just stick, it, stick to this. All right. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. These are the words of Jesus. Hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. You ought to have done without leaving the others 
undone. He wasn't telling those Pharisees, don't pay tithe. In fact, he was saying, you ought to do this. But he said what they were doing was they were becoming so particular that they were even tithing their spices. They were, they were nitpicking. Compare my tithe with your tithe. See, I got some curry leaves inside. Nice. Yeah. See yours? Just flour. You know, this is, count how many curry leaves I have. Count. They were nitpicking. And in the meantime, they were oppressing other people and bullying them. And Jesus said, you hypocrites. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. He said, you hypocrites, you scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, you should have tithed. He didn't say, hey, guys, imagine you guys are still tithing. I already came and you guys are still on the tithe thing. Get a grip. No, he didn't say that. He said, you ought to do that. But he says, not forgetting the other important things that you're also supposed to be doing. So, in our Bible study, we taught this. And listen carefully, because some of you were not here. Three things happened when Jesus came from the old, because some people, will, I'll deal with that in a little while. Isn't this Old Testament, Pastor? As I said just now, Abraham existed even before the Levitical law was passed. So there are three things that happened when Jesus came. Try to remember this, and it'll help you the rest of your interpretation of Old Testament, New Testament. Should I do this? How can I do that? When Jesus came, three things happened. Number one, some things were not allowed to come through the cross. They were abolished. That means when Jesus came, finished. Something stopped of the Old Testament. So no more sacrificing of your goats and your cow. We don't want blood flowing all over this place. You know, we don't have, you know, all of that. So some things were stopped. All the ceremonies and all the, all the laws and all those things that used to happen, everything died. It stopped when Jesus came because he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. One sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Some things came through the cross. What came through the cross? Like, for example, praise and worship. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalms 150. And we practice that. He says, praise the Lord, all you people. Then he says, praise him in the heavens. Praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him with the loud cymbal. Praise him with the clanging cymbal. Praise him with the lute. Praise him with the harp. Praise him with sounding instruments. Let everything that has breath. Everybody say, let everything, let everything. that has breath. That has breath. Praise, the Lord. praise the Lord. So we don't have to rewrite those psalms in the New Testament. It came through the cross. So today we make noise, we shout, we dance. Why are you doing that? That was only Old Testament. Bible is silent in the New Testament about it. Where do you refer your praise and worship? From the Bible. It came through the cross. Same with tithing. Bible doesn't, New Testament doesn't make much reference about it. Jesus mentions it. It comes through the cross. So we don't have to repeat that. The New Testament expression of the believer is that God is a big and a generous God. So why do we give our tithe and beyond our tithe? Because we want to follow God. He's a generous God. God's heart is like this. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible tells us, and we all know this scripture. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave. All right? So that's the nature of God. So we give towards homes, we give towards uh, works that are out there, churches that are suffering. We're involved with them. We are totally involved with them. Okay, question number five. What happens when I tithe? What happens when I tithe? Listen carefully. Watch this. You don't even have to be a Christian to learn this principle. Most of the success teachings that you get in success uh, seminars in businesses came from the Bible. They won't acknowledge that it's from the Bible. For example, if you want to have friends, you've got to be stupid. stupid. Right, okay. <laughs> if you want to have friends, you've got to be? Ready. Yeah. You've got to smile. You've got to relax and chill. If you're tense and you're grouchy, nobody. Who wants to be your friend if you're a grouch? 
How many of you love your grouchy friends? I can't just wait to escape from their presence. I'll just go like, oh, okay, hi, bye, finish. That's, I don't, time is too precious for me. So I love to hang around people who are nice and accommodating, and I try to be that way myself. Where did you get that principle? From the book of Proverbs. If you want to have friends, you got to be friendly. And so the Bible teaches these principles. Non-Christians, let's face it, how many of you can agree with me that there are some non-Christians non -Christian, who have better marriages than some Christians? How many of you know that? Yep. Why? Because they are applying some principle. I'm not talking about going to heaven. Going to heaven is a Jesus-only thing. Okay, by grace, you are saved through faith, so we can't boast. But I have heaven on earth. Non-Christians can take principles in the Bible and apply it. So Chinese people, during Chinese New Year, they go around giving ang pao's. They, they make it a part of their culture. Some Indian cultures, they say, they give out a lot. Of, they're always giving charity. You find Shepherd Center, our orphanage, our biggest 90% of our finances come from Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists. No way our church finances can afford to run a shepherd center like that. No way our church could afford. We, we, we're, just, we're just paying Pastor Jacob and Pastor Bridget a full salary. But there's no way our income can support 50 over 1,000, 70 over 1,000 a month to run the orphanage. Where do you think it comes from? And so these people get blessed. How come they are non-Christian? That burger is a cheater. He steals. He's such a, he cheats on his wife and all of that. But financially, he's fellow's doing okay. Guess why? Company, a certain percentage gives to his charity so he can evade tax, whatever. It doesn't matter. But they learn how to give towards charity. They learn to care for the poor. And God honors them. Strange, isn't it? I thought God would only want to bless a Christian. Oh, no. Now, that giving won't take them to heaven. It brings a bit of heaven on earth. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8. This is about that pie we were talking about. He says, when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? This is called giving God the leftovers. God had a complaint in the book of Malachi through the prophet. He said, this is how you've been treating me. You brought the cow that you didn't want, couldn't sell, it has three legs. It's got disease. You brought the sheep that has Alzheimer's. It is, it is walking about. It's nervous as anything. And you didn't know even, I mean, you won't even slaughter that. I mean, if your boss came, he will taste the meat. He'll know something is wrong. You brought that sick chicken that was featherless, had one eye. <laughs> and uh, you, you didn't want to cook it for, you know, guests coming. So you gave it to my house. I'm, this is Jeremiah interpretation. This is my version. In the book of Malachi, and if you read it very Shakespearean-like, because, you know, the English was very old, it says, when you offer the blind as your sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord? Some people like that to be read in church. I'll say, you're no manners, sir. Would you do that to your boss? You'll take your boss to a mama store. Huh? You won't. What will you do? Oh, you tell your wife you better put out the best china because boss is coming. Don't bring out the styrofoam cups. Don't you dare bring out all the other things that has got chips. Make sure all the wine, wine glasses, not one chip, and make sure they're crystal and they sound pong. And you don't bring out the table wine. No, no, no. You bring out the best that's in the cellar. You bring out the best. You put it there. Wife and boss come. Wife comes in. Hello. Because he's your boss. 
Pastor, come to here. Help yourself, Pastor. Make yourself at home. <laughs> no, 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 no. You've never done that. No, 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 no. no. I wouldn't even come to your house. No, no, no. But here, God was. Here was God saying, "Hey, this is how you treat me. This is how you say I am your boss. I am your God. I'm your owner. This is how you bring your offering." And then in chapter 3, we all know this ever-famous scripture. We've heard it quoted and read again and again. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 12 says this. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Where have we robbed you? In what way have we robbed you? He said, in your tithes and offerings. You have robbed me. You cursed with a curse. And you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That, may, that they may be food in my house. And try me now. Test me. Everybody say test. test. Test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, there will be no. I pray that every single one of you, especially you young people in Jesus' name and older people as well, that you will experience the open heavens and the favor of God upon your life. As your pastor and as your friend, I want to see that happen in your life. He, he wants to bless you. And so as your friend and as your pastor, as your coach, I'm here to tell you, this is how God wants to do things in your life. There's no shortcut about it. He doesn't want you broken, you know, more broken than the Ten Commandments. Boring here, owing there, lying here, manipulating there. But just having the windows of heaven, young people, you get married, you don't get married in debt and owing here and doing this and doing that. That you get blessed by God so abundantly that the favor of God is upon you, my God. You will shine, Jesus said. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that people may see your good works and glorify God. They will say, my God, if this is their God, man, he, he's something else's God. They will glorify God and his name. Are you listening? And so he says, I will open the windows of heaven. So, question number six. What happens when I don't tithe? What happens when I don't tithe? According to Malachi, you curse. You're robbing God. You know, the word miserable comes from the word miser. Am I correct? The word miserable, you see some people who are miserable all the time and miserable health, miserable marriage, miserable finances, no friends. They are miserable. If you go sit near with them, you feel you need a bath because, you know, they're just like... It's just, it's just a miserable old grouch they become. I don't want to become like that. As life goes on and things happen and things are hard, I don't, wanna, I wanna, I don't want to grow into a grouchy old fart, you know, where you stink and you don't even realize it. But everybody smells that you stink. But you don't realize it. You think, oh, well, yeah, a miserable person. Well, it comes from the word miser. And when you're tight in your giving, when you're tight in your showing an expression of love, you become a miserable person. But when you're big hearted and you open the door to other people, Become a big hearted blessing to so many other people. I want you to take the word of God. Number seven, finally. What if after I hear all this, I'm still stressed, I'm still nervous, I'm scared about giving? Well, let's go back to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, and I'll conclude with this. This is called the tithe challenge. Nowhere in the Bible does God ever tell anybody to test them, to test him. Nowhere. In fact, the Bible tells us uh, in 1 Corinthians, if you can turn to that first, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 10, verse 9, he says, and let us not test Christ as some of them have tested him or tempted him and were destroyed by serpents. The Bible says, don't tempt the Lord God. Don't test him. 
But somehow here in Malachi, going back to Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, God says this very clearly. He says, bring all the tithe into my storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me. So this last question, I'm still nervous. I'm still tense. I'm still anxious because times are bad. Finances are hard to come by. You're asking me to give my tithe, to bring my tithe and above. It's just very, makes me feel very nervous, Pastor. I don't know if I can do this. Well, my challenge to you, listen carefully, look at me. My challenge to you is that you can test God on this one issue. And if you cannot trust God for your financial breakthrough, don't even trust him for heaven. How do you know there's a heaven? Have you been there? How do you know there's a hell? Have you seen it? Why trust him for an eternity that you don't even know is real? If you don't know how to trust him with finances and things that are tangible, now. So here's my test, ladies and gentlemen, as I close. Finally, let me tell you this. For this next 90 days, if you have never been, if you've never been a tither, Talk to people who are. Email us and write to us and ask us questions. You are welcome to write. We will not get offended. Listen, no questions asked about you, about your job. Your, that's none of our business. All right? That is not my business. That's not my calling. My calling is to make sure you do really well in every area of your life. And I'm committed as your pastor and as your friend. Guys, I want to see you come out of debt. Many of our young people who are here, your parents have sacrificed. They have sacrificed so you can be in this country. And maybe I'll address more about this in my other session. You need to realize you're here today because your mom and dad, they loved you and they sent their money for you to come over here. It's not for you to go, go outside, get stoned, get drunk, be an idiot, and then expect your parents you know, to keep paying money towards you. Forgive me, kids. I love you, but I'm, I'm your friend. I'm not your enemy. I'm your pastor. I'll fight for you. If there's a fight, I'll stand in your corner, and I'll be praying for you. I'll fight for you. But I'm going to tell you something. You'll get off your high horse. You're where you are today because of the grace of God and very kind parents. And you need to honor them and don't splash around and fool around. I would say the same thing. I, I, I had... I have a daughter overseas, and she went to study there, and I'll tell her, this is the amount I'm giving to you. You work your butt off if you want to work in, um, in Australia, and you stand there, and she did, and so did my other younger daughter. They worked hard. They served table. They had maids in the home in Malaysia, in our home, nice, beautiful home, but they wanted to go out there and try something, so I said, you go out there, you work at McDonald's. You work in that Indian man's restaurant. Oh, Papa, he's a grouch. Serves you right. Because when I grumbled, you were not happy. Now, you're working in a restaurant where there's Indian people in Australia. Oh, my papa, my feet are killing me. And I said, oh, you poor thing. Can I send, can mommy and I send you some lotion? No, you stay there and you work. So I've had kids, so I'm not telling you something I've not myself gone through with my children. And today they are prospering. They've got doors open for for work, and I mean, they, some of them are calling my youngest daughter for, for jobs. Doors have just opened. She's at school. She's taking a tithe. The blessing, she's a tither. She's known to tithe ever since she could walk. When she gets her ang pao, she will take 10%. All my kids did it. Debbie, Anna, and Elizabeth. All of them, when they get the ang pao from the, from the grandma, big money, you know, Singapore money, big money. Or oh, they won't tell us how much it is. They'll all go sit down together, and the first thing they will do, 10%, is go to church. They can't wait to put it into the bucket. And then they'll take the rest and save it or do whatever they want with it. And so it's no accident. They're all doing fine by the grace of God. I'm not saying you buy God's blessing with finances. It's showing God, in God, I trust. I trust God. So I want to challenge you. If you've not done this before, tithe, it doesn't matter what your income might be, 
But if you will learn for the next 90 days, everybody say 90 days. For the, if you've never done tithe before, for the next 90 days, say, God, every time that when I get my paycheck, if you don't get a paycheck, you don't have to tithe. God's not unreasonable. But for the next 90 days, when you get your paycheck, say, that first 10% is not going to, I'm not going to look at that pie and look at all my expenses and then worry and give God the leftovers. I'm going to give God my first. I'm going to live God by seeking first the kingdom of God. Not in time, but you seek God with all your heart first. So I don't care if you had a late Saturday night party. You say Sunday is the Lord's day. I, even if it kills me and I come to church looking like Count Dracula's wife, it doesn't matter. I'll get there and I'll come to church. God help me and I'll worship the Lord. I will seek his kingdom first. Young men and young women, you are going to have a great, prosperous life. I can one look at you. I can, I'm, one day I will visit you in some country or even here where you'll be living prosperously and yet humbly because you got off your high horse and began to realize I have a responsibility as a child of God. In God, we trust. Really? Amen? Amen? So I want, to, I want you to trust God. This next 90 days, if you've never been a tither, bring it to the house of God. And say, this is my tithe. Put it in there. Trust God. And see what God can do. Now, if after the 90 days, look at me, please. If after the 90 days, nothing happens, you don't have to say a word to me. No questions asked. You don't have to give your tithe. Because if we can't trust God here, how are we going to trust him for eternity? You don't have to tell anybody, I stopped paying my tithe because after 90 days, nothing happened. Test me now. He said it. Hey, I'm not being blasphemous. He said it. I'm very respectful of God's word. Test me now if I will not open the windows of heaven. If after 90 days, nothing happened, you can send me, as usual, one of those anonymous emails and say, Dear Pastor Joe, it was a bunch of crap. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> it can prove me a liar. But you can't prove God to be a liar. Amen. Are you okay, everybody? It took a while, but Chin Pei, you were there until the end. <laughs> You were there till the end. This is not easy messages that I preach, and I tell you, they call it the hot seat. Hey, you're doing good. Let's stand together. I want to pray for you. That's my job as your pastor. Pray for you that you will do well. They just keep the lights on. I like to look at them when I'm praying. I want to look at their faces. I want to pronounce the blessing. Man, I want to pronounce the blessing of God. I want you to take some instruction here from your friend. Okay, who loves you, cares about your well-being, wants you to do well, wants you to apply the word of God. I want you to take up this challenge and say, all right, Pastor, you put a challenge on me. This is the beginning of the month. I'll come next week. I'll bring my tithe. I won't have to wait for anybody to tell me what to do. If you want to know the bank accounts, whatever, whatever, it's up to you. But you make sure you bring the tithe. Don't bring a, a cow or a goat. I, I, I won't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know what I mean. Bring your first fruits to the Lord. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray for every man and every woman in this room. Whatever their age or their status might be, whatever income they are getting, even if it's just allowances they are getting from their parents, or some have just started a new job, and they're all nervy about it. God, many of them have been frightened by the enemy with all kinds of fear about the uncertainty of the, the nation they've been told whatever money you can take out of your bank take it out because they're all going to shut down put it in another country get out of town father I come against every curse that has been spoken against Malaysia I break it in Jesus name I rebuke it Lord, you said to Abraham, if there are 10 people, Abraham said to you, if there are 10 people in that wicked city, will you spare? And you said, yes. Lord, there are more than 10 people in KL today who love you. Certainly more 
than 10 people in Malaysia who have not bowed their knee, who love you. We know you will spare Malaysia. And not only spare Malaysia, you will bless as we bless Malaysia in the name of Jesus. So we boldly cancel all those curse words over our country and over our people, especially our young people and young parents and young husbands and wives. We cancel every work of the enemy and we ask for your blessing. The blessing that you promised in Malachi. You said you will open the windows of heaven. And we know that 2,000 years ago, that window, that heavens was torn open, Jesus, when you were baptized, when we heard the heavens were rent open, and we heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son. Lord, it is all about you, Lord Jesus, that we are blessed, we are beloved because of you. We are blessed coming in, we are blessed going out. We'll be the head and not the tail. The enemy will come against us one way, but yea, he will flee seven ways because the Lord has blessed us. Hallelujah. Favor of God. Favor of God. In Jesus' name. Go ahead. Leave your seat, watch. Wonderful God. Let's. I know we've taken a lot of time. I know we've got meetings and all of that. But I want us to just spend time worshiping God. Can we do that? Just spend time. Just get into His presence. It's not about trying to learn a new trick with God. God doesn't play games. But I want us to just open our hearts, be sensitive and open to God. And let's worship Him together in Jesus' name.
whatever you might take away from this service today, take away this, that God loves you, Jesus passionately and individually loves every single one of you. You say, but pastor, I failed something bad last week. He still loves you. The pastor, I, I've been unfaithful to God. He still loves you. Nothing you can do will disqualify you from his love. Take that with you as you go home. We're talking this morning not about your worth. Your worth has been settled. You're worth so much that his blood was spilled for you. So we're not talking about how much God loves you and how valuable you are to God. We're talking about applicable principles in his word. Whether it is marriage, whether it's having a family, whether it's prospering and financial, getting a good job, we're talking about that. And we pray that you will apply this principle. I want to challenge those of you to make up your mind about taking that tithe challenge. Make it a challenge, your personal challenge. And see what God can do in your life. I ask that the favor of God be upon each and every one of you in Jesus' name. The blessing of God be upon every single one of you. As we face this very uncertain times and difficult times, we refuse to speak what other people are saying. We speak the word of God. We speak open heavens. We declare the favor and the blessing of God coming in and going out. We speak health and healing upon our bodies and our minds so that we can continue to serve him with all our energy that God has chosen to bless you and bless me so that we could be a blessing to many people in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We love you. Turn to somebody, give them a big high five or a handshake or punch in the arm or whatever what some of you are doing in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. Listen. I know there was a very bad traffic. Is the traffic still bad out there? Terrible. So I understand you came late. But I'm a very moving preacher, I think. But I cannot preach to a moving congregation. If you people are still coming in and going out and going to the loo and coming in, uh, try to hold it in. And if you came late, try to make it as quiet as possible. In Jesus' name. But I'm so glad you came. You braved the traffic. And you, you I mean, you know, I, I came this morning trying to come really early. And then I got texts from Matthias who saying, turn this and that. And it's the most confusing person. He doesn't hear, come here, you stop hiding. And I had to go up and make a U. But it's all good, all good, all good. Amen. Some of our Clank people are coming now because we have a lead meeting, so they're, they're, they're just going to be, you know, going around. And whatever we do today, please, Matthew, don't give anybody any more instructions on which is the shortest route to get here. We love you. Let's do one more song, and God bless you. We love you. Give the Lord a big hand, shall we? Thank the Lord. Amen.